Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for today's session. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, today's session will be covering deployment plans for EV charge points and uh, how we go about determining what the uh, best type of charging solution is for, for a given area. This is the second in a, in a series of webinar sessions now that uh, we've been bringing to you from uh, Liberty Charge with the aim of encouraging discussion and, and sharing knowledge really across uh, across the, the industry and across uh, industry stakeholders. My name's Matt Croucher. I'm the EV Services Director at Liberty Charge. Um, I've been working in electric vehicles now since around 2010 um, and joined Liberty Charge having previously spent 20 years in transport planning consultancy. So I joined Liberty Charge in, in May. Um, and I'd like to welcome now uh, into the session our, our panelists for today. Who uh, there we go? Uh, who are joining me on screen now? Um, so we've got a, a we're fortunate today to have a huge amount of experience in the in the the virtual room in terms of deploying EV charging infrastructure, um, uh, with with a real good idea of, of of what good looks like and some some tips to share with you all today, as well as some 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 lessons learned. Um, so uh, I would also just encourage uh, people in the audience, if, if you've got questions at any point, please do feel free to, to, to raise those. Uh, you should see uh, on the, the, the interface below the screen there and ask your question option. So just stick your question in the chat function there. If you want to direct it to, to, to a particular uh, uh, panelist, please please include their name. Otherwise, you can, you're welcome to pitch a more general question to everyone. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, perhaps now if we if we ask each of the panelists in turn to to introduce themselves and just give us a bit of background on uh, uh, what your involvement in electric vehicle charging has been to date and, and, and what your role is uh, within your authority or organisation. Uh, Ian, would you would you mind going first? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Ian A. Church. I'm head of economy and strategy North Lancashire Council. It's a new unitary council. It was created in 2021. Experience in terms of the EV agenda is, is relatively kind of new. Uh, so uh, Northamptonshire is a kind of a, an, an area uh, first started or got, got involved with Liberty Charge and the kind of wider kind of sector in 2019, really to learn, to learn more. But provision was very, very low in terms of the figures we had for DFT, but it was an ambition to, to stimulate uh, vehicles and to also understand more about, about the market. So uh, the kind of engagement first started with the County Council and then North Amsterdam was split into two unitary authority areas in, in April 2021. Uh, and I work for the North, uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, and the North are very committed to, to the net zero agenda. And this is a, a very kind of a tangible and visible way of supporting that agenda. Uh, we've been working with Liberty Charge now for about three years. Our first charging points have been Installed and operational from earlier this year. Uh, we've got 12 locations each with four charging points. So, still new to this agenda, but, but yeah, learn, learning rapidly and, and enjoying the journey. Thanks. Brilliant. Mike. Thanks, Ian. Um, Peter, would you mind going next? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Peter McDonald. I'm in the strategic transport team in Croydon, which is an outer London borough, and we stretch from Crystal Palace almost down to the M25 sort of serving terraces of back to back housing through to suburbs and fields. Um, so very different needs. Uh, the borough now has about 100 commercial bays, so sort of retail and, and so on, and over 300 council ones. Uh, I was first involved installing electric vehicle charging points as part of a London wide scheme before the Olympics. Um, and numbers grew slowly over the next few years uh, and have really taken off in the last year or two with Liberty Charge. And we've got 52 locations with 208 charging bays. So that's that's pretty good. And I've worked with half a dozen other providers, uh, including with Transport for London, putting rapids on the red routes um, and Source London, Lamp, Colin, Bollards, the, the whole range. And good to be here this afternoon. Brilliant, thank you. And Dan? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan McQuarrie, Principal Transport Planner of Transport Strategy at Aaron Swift and Fulham Council. 
House of Fulham's uh, inner London borough, densely residential, not much open space, highly congested curbside. So uh, EV delivery has been interesting over the years. I've been leading EV delivery here at Hammersmith since 2015. And we've been working with a number of different partners over the years, delivering a different mix of charge points through various different schemes as well. Um, to date, we've got about 1500 charge points across the borough. That's including dedicated sites, lamp columns, rapids, and some ultra rapids on, on privately owned land. Brilliant, thank you. And last but by no means least, Sean. Hi there, my name is Sean Quirk. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Liberty Charge. I suppose my time in EV started back in 2015. Um, I was employed by SSC to support uh, the, the, the new rollout of uh, Source London after Bellore bought it from uh, TfL. Um, so that was where my journey started. Uh, predominantly in London, predominantly in fast chargers, I suppose I've led the team that's most probably installed over 2,000 charge points on street and in, in, in uh, council car parks. Um, but looking forward to sort of learn a bit more around sort of the, the, the lamppost and the uh, rapid side of it at the moment as well. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. And, and you know, I think as, as you'll appreciate uh, listening in, we've got a, a, a real good range of experience there in terms of different types of location and, and different approaches taken so far. So um, looking forward to the discussion. Um, we thought we'd kick off today um, just by running a couple of polls just to kind of gauge uh, w where you're at in the audience as well, really, in terms of uh, deployment and the different types of solutions you're looking at. So I'm just going to activate the first of the, the, the polls here. I'm hoping this works. So um, you should get an option on screen now uh, to vote for what is your current focus in terms of EV charging and the types of charger that you are deploying. And you can see the various different options. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can see the votes coming in. Um, so uh, between slow or lamp column charging, fast 7 to 22 kilowatt charging, rapid charging, or a combination of the above. Let's just give a little bit more time for those votes to trickle in. Okay. And then if I scroll on to the, the kind of second related question, was around uh, what is your current focus in terms of EV charging and the types of location uh, you're deploying across? Let me just start that one as well. So having established what types of charging technologies you're looking at, as in slow, fast, or rapid, uh, we're interested to know what type of location you're currently focusing on, whether it's on street, off street, or, or a mix. And again, this is potentially likely to be dictated to a degree by what's within your your remit as a as a county or a district, for example, or a borough or a unit tree. Right, interesting. So um, I, I'm not sure what you can see on screen there, but I'm just going to just kind of read out what what I'm seeing, um, and that'd be good to get opinions from the panel. So what what I'm seeing on my screen is is that in terms of the types of charging solutions being that that, that is the focus for the audience. It's 71% is a, is a mix of solutions, which I think is really encouraging. So a mix of slow, fast, rapid, or at least a combination of a couple of them. Um, and then 3% uh, slow, 18% fast, 8% rapid. So predominantly fast, but, but most people are looking at a, a mix of at least two of those different solutions. And in terms of location, um, oh, no, I click end on that. Um, in terms of location, uh, it was predominantly off street, 46%, 14% on street, and then again, 40%, a mix of, of, of both. So uh, any reflections on that from, from our panelists? How does that compare with, with what you would have expected and, and, and the approach you're taking? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on uh, in here. Yeah, so that's seen 71% are looking for a combination of solutions. That's, that's exactly what, what I would advocate is needed. You know, we've, when, when deploying charge points, you've really got to think about the, the different road users. The obvious go-to for local authorities is to think about the residents and how they're going to charge overnight and to compensate those with, with off-street 
sort of um, off street parking, so they don't have the feasibility to install their own charge points to do their triple charging overnight. And um, whilst that is important, I think what's in becoming increasingly important is having the, the fast to rapid chargers that are going to support the, the taxis, the commercial fleets, and, and, our, and sort of internal council fleets as well. So, yeah, reassuring to see that's where, where every, the majority are aspiring towards. Yeah, P Matt, Peter, Ian, any, any observations from your yeah, side yeah. on... Sorry. Yeah, I can come in, Matt. Uh, yeah, so in, in terms of North, Am North Northamptonshire, we've, we've focused more on on-street, uh, conscious that... Uh, about thirty percent of residents don't have access to to kind of off street off street parking, and kind of keen to kind of tackle that. Uh, so that's been our focus for the kind of nineteen sites, and for each of those, is, is four bays in in in, a, in our area, of which that kind of on, on is easy, but it's definitely where we kind of see the kind of market failure, and and so it's our role is to, to, to kind of market pure. And, and become more kind of commercial in terms of you know the market delivering rather than relying on on the local authorities, uh, especially outside London. Obviously, in London, it's it is more mature. Great. Yeah, yeah. And from Croydon. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think it's right that everybody's looking at a combination of solutions. Uh, you've always got to think, what is it that the electric vehicle driver wants, rather than what do we as a council want. Um, I, I'm, it's interesting there's so many off street because our experience in Croydon to date has been the off street ones haven't been well used. Equally, the, the, the reality is that every location is different. So, yeah, I, I, it's interesting to observe. Uh, Sean, anything from your side yeah. on, on that? How well, I suppose, I suppose from my side, predominantly being sort of in that on-street space um, and, and, and having sort of rolled out a number of charge points, as you say, I think the the mix is key because not one is going to fit all. So, you know, there'd be no point sort of turning up at uh, on, on a major A road and then sort of have a have a lamppost charger there where you're looking for a quick charge. So it's about putting that right infrastructure in place and, and, and it does need to be a mix. Um, again, you know, with the on-street, off-street, um, <clears throat> I think obviously some local authorities, especially district, only have car parks. So obviously you've got to look more at the the off-street side of it. Um, but yeah, definitely the mix is key. But it's also as well understanding the cars as well um, and about that right infrastructure. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on the big rapid hubs, but as we know, not every car can take that sort of charge. So it's trying to put all the different all the different things into the, 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 the mix to try and come up with that right solution. Uh, yeah, sorry, Ian, did you have another point? Yeah, yeah, I did do that. Uh, yeah, uh, what, what we did, which was found quite helpful, was we, we set up a kind of register your interest, like a portal, uh, so we could find out from residents. It links to Peter's point about, well, what do people want? So, so through that portal, people were able to identify you know where they thought was a kind of good location so it may well be at work it could be uh center where people are at a leisure center or shopping although obviously shopping tends to be probably one of the kind of first areas which is going to serve commercially superstores etc we're also also at home so that's been really valuable in terms of you know identifying sites but also kind of engaging with the public to find out you know are there any kind of hot spots where or you know ideal locations where we should perhaps be looking first yeah, I'd, I'd second that. That you know, that's really important to, to get that um, resident support and be able to demonstrate the the demand in in areas. Certainly going to help you when you come through to sort of consultation engagement. That, that links ni nicely to my next question, which was going to be around your top tips. So having established uh, and and getting getting a sense from the audience as well in terms of types of charging solutions you're looking to deploy and, and, and you're thinking around that and what makes them the right solution for a, a given area. Um, what would then your top tips be around the deployment of those and, and being able to deliver those those solutions that you've identified and the locations you're targeting? Um, don't know if anyone wants to go first. Or... I'm happy to sort of build on what I was saying of the, the resident sure. demand. So, so yeah, being able to demonstrate that resident demand is, you know, extremely important. And it, I'd say that becomes important when you, when you're seeking the political support. If you can have get 
you, you know, um, garner political support early on in the process, ensure that your reasons for site selection are quite robust. You have criteria to demonstrate why and where you've chosen sites. And that is endorsed by, by politicians and decision makers. That gives you really good footing for when you do go enter the, the engagement and consultation phases to be able to not, you know, to be able to challenge any objections, to show that there is this strategy behind your placement and, uh, and, and ultimately sort of get through that first hurdle of, of TMO. Yeah, it, it, it makes so much difference, doesn't it, to be able to kind of have an evidence base and a, and a kind of clear plan to, to underpin what you're what you're then proposing for, for 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 when pushback may arise. I mean, is that is that is that a similar experience, uh, Ian Peter, to to, to 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 yourselves, and how have you approached that? Yeah, sure. I'll go. I'll go next then, Matt. Mm. Yeah. So I think yes, yes, it is. Three three points I was going to make. Make one was around that kind of. Uh, kind of engagement. Uh, part of it is around information as well, giving information to people so they understand, you know, the, the kind of agenda uh, and the policy context as well. What we did is it works with, we, we went beyond just residents and contacted local councils as well. I should have said at the start that you know, North Northamptonshire is very different to kind of kind of the, the, the kind of areas. It's kind of a polycentric, medium, small sized towns, kind of large villages. So we contacted all the kind of the town and parish councils, all the councillors to kind of give them information, gave them the opportunity to suggest uh, locations. So no, well, it was difficult to say, well, we didn't know. And people had the opportunity, uh, which, which was kind of really interesting. And also to understand the difference between kind of rapid, fast, slow. People, it, is, it is quite technical and, and people, you know, some people know, but a lot of people don't. Uh, so there is something about this demystifying the, the technology uh, the point about kind of political support is really, really important. So getting that kind of executive member or your portfolio board holder on, on site, on, on board, you know, informed that we, we, we've got very, very kind of uh, strong support at the North North Dance, which, which makes it much easier, to be honest. He's happy to be a very visible lead in terms of this agenda. And my, my third point was around kind of managing expectations as well. People need to, need to understand that just because you identify a site, it may not necessarily progress for different reasons, whether that's around commercial and cost, for example, sufficient power supply or, or other kind of barriers barriers to that. And some of it could be around public opposition from, from other residents. So it is about kind of managing expectations is, is quite important. In fact, that we'll, we'll investigate these sites, but you know, until all work's been done, obviously the kind of TRO process outside London, you know, there, there aren't any kind of cast iron guarantees. Yeah, I, I wondered if you wanted to come in on that, Sean. Actually, when we when we come on to that, <laughs> yeah, the joys. Yeah, um, <laughs> do you want to go first, Peter? I think you were. Or... Yeah, oh, sorry, go on, Peter. It, it was only to say that uh, where you're using a grant, particularly the on-road charging scheme, uh, having that resident request is a requirement. Um, so, sort of gathering that data is really important. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose for me, there's, I mean, all the things that uh, the other panelists have said are, are really key, you know, from that political buy-in, et cetera, the residents, um, and actually, you know, even within the LA actually being aligned, whether it's planning, parking, uh, highways as well, you know, that sort of thing all makes really, uh, really key to sort of on, a, on to, to help it move forward. I think from a delivery perspective as well, um, I think especially <clears throat> if you look at the sort of 25 London local authorities I've worked with, I think there's quite a few different processes, et cetera, trying to take that through to the build stage. Um, you know, and again, I think I think obviously knowing and working with the local authority to sort of, yeah, as long, as long as you sort of know the guidelines and work through with them, then, you know, you can deliver it. I mean, there's various things that uh, experimental TMO, I'm sure is, is, is one route that we've actually taken with one local authority that seemed to go down quite well. And then we've gone to the other extreme of uh, of actually going down the full planning route for sort of fast chargers. Um, so, but as long as you know the guidelines that you've got to work within, but yeah, also, I mean, from a delivery perspective, the easiest route to market is always the best one for to, to do that. Um, 
And regardless, obviously, as Ian said, you know, there is processes and, you know, we've learned a number of things throughout the years. Um, and, and sort of actually we've, as Ian just said, we had a, a sort of with Western Power is a, is a totally new sort of DNO for me, having worked with sort of SSE and uh, UKPN. So we did have some challenges on run, some of the sites around there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's working as collaborative with, with the team from the political all the way through to the residents that will make it go through. Um, we have some questions come in from the from from the audience, which I, I'll just read out, and 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 uh, they're not addressed to anyone in particular. So uh, anyone who wants to respond, please do. So the first one is is from Olin Dudley, who said, "How have the experts overcome the difficulty of lack of general street parking for residents when installing lamp post charging, and when there is when there is conflict for residents with uh, in, internal combustion engine vehicles?" Um, does anyone like to respond to that? How have, how have you addressed that conflict? Uh, yeah, I, I we've got quite got a significant yeah. yeah, we've got quite a significant rollout of lamp columns underway, um, and we we had probably about three hundred and fifty before that rollout started. Now, the the premise of the lamp lamp column charge point is that it can be installed. And, uh, and and operates without needing to make amendments to the, the existing parking arrangements. Now on the surface, that sounds great, but as we know in reality, we, we experience what's called icing. So um, blocking of the charge point by an internal combustion engine for a long period of time. You can imagine if someone goes away on, on holiday for a couple of weeks, that charge point might be out of action. Now, in a lot of circumstances, we found that, that that it has that they have worked without too much icing but where icing does occur we have actually looked at some instances of dedicating certain bays so not all are def definitely come with with a uh, with a dedicated bay but we monitor the usage we look at complaints coming from sort of residents that want to access that charge point and then we make a decision as to whether or not it is actually feasible to dedicate that bay now obviously that comes with the the standard issues that you're going to face if you make any changes to, to parking arrangements. Um, but we found in in some certain circumstances, the utilization at those charge points has increased by 70% when provided with a dedicated bay. So in response, how do you overcome it in, in the long term? I think there's two strategies. One is you want to seek to dedicate more bays where possible. Or if you can achieve a density where there are other, other options for people needing to access those charge points, then also that's going to mit mitigate that conflict as well. Brilliant, thanks, luxury, Dan. Is luxury it? of funding and, and uh, yeah. number of available <laughs> lamp columns. <laughs> did, did anyone else have any other points they wanted to make on that? Well, I mean, for me, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really an advocate for sort of dedicating the bays, you know, you know, for fast and and you know, for, for lampposts, et cetera, you know, purely because you, you, you know, you are providing someone by putting a dedicated bay there, you're actually providing someone uh, a, a safety charging zone, if you want to call it that. So you're creating an area that they can park, you know that, you know, that they're by the lamppost or fast charge or whatever. And, and, you know, you're not then getting the extended leads. I mean, obviously we've seen them all on social media. I think you can now buy a, a 30 meter type two lead um you know and there's a number of things going around now obviously i don't think you'll ever cure people of doing that but you know the fact that you've gone out there and provided a, an, an area a safety zone not only just for the person that's charging so they've got no risk of electric shock from other electrical infrastructure but you're also then providing a safe place for sort of residents to walk past as well so as i say you know trailing leads is going to be potentially something that will happen uh, as I say, especially as they start to make the leads longer and longer. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm a great advocate for that. Uh, the, the, the all bays being dedicated until such point where everyone's got an EV and and, and you won't get the icing factor. Uh, we, we've had a kind of related question come in to to, to your response there, Dan, in, in talking around kind of ensuring density of provision. So uh, David Beard has asked, uh, what is the density of charge point provision? Uh, on street so I, I guess that's kind of referring to what kind of density are you aiming at to provide sufficient coverage yeah if you if give me a second Difficult I question find out, <laughs> I find out it's the exact figure of what we've got in the borough but 
it's going to depend on you know the density of housing stock the type you know the, the type of of that housing stock is it multi-occupancy single dwelling um you know are you town center are you sort of the you know more sort of residential areas but we are aiming to have at least one charge point in every single residential street in the borough and i know in some some streets we have up to four already so it's so that's a that's a, a figure i suppose i can give that, that hopefully answers your question david quite a nice indication there just as a as a ballpark here you know, kind of street by street level um, although obviously every location is is gonna gonna differ. Um, yeah, yeah, interestingly, so, for outer London, Croydon, uh, th th that is a similar kind of number that I'm looking at. Uh, obviously, we don't know precisely how many roads have no off street parking or limited off street parking, but but it is roughly that. Uh, and London was fortunate to have some independent research done looking at likely numbers needed by 2025 2030 2035 and indeed it that also turned out about the same um okay. so one per road um that said where you can put in more than one on a road uh, and with liberty charge we've put four bays where we can um then it increases the chances of people being able to find a charging bay free um so it, it will vary um, there's quite a few other questions coming through here. So there are, there are. Um, one's just dropped off as well, which is helpful. Where's that gone? Oh, well, here it is. Yeah, sorry. So uh, the next question I was going to read out is uh, from from Rosemary Aitchison, uh, who has said, "Can you please explain who pays to install these charging points? How do users pay for their charge? Who collects the money for the charge? Uh, obviously, it depends upon where the point is located. So." Um, who wants to take that question? Oh. I think I think there's most probably quite a few different. I think there's quite a few different scenarios there, isn't there? There are. Yeah. I, I can start by pointing you to the Energy Saving Trust guide, um, which is really useful for councils, but also what I direct people, residents and councillors to, because it does explain what charges are and and that kind of thing. Um, who pays? Well, to date, I've been very lucky that uh, the different companies or government grants have all paid. Um, we've had in London some money from Transport for London, um, and then I've used some Section 106 planning money. Um, so there's, we're fortunate in Croydon, I've not put any council money in, uh, but in other places you might need to do that. Um, Users pay usually with a um, with, with an app or an RFID card, uh, and that'll vary by the provider. I mean, we can talk about that at, at some length. Um, so it's the charge point operator who collects the money for the charging, uh, and then through your contract, you'll have agreed uh, a means by which the council um, receives some share of that income. Uh, which could either be a fixed fee per year um, or a, a, a straight percentage share of the income. That is something that you've got to take to um, And again, there's a lot more could be discussed about that. Um, yeah. I think that's a pretty good answer to those various questions, to be yeah. fair, Peter. I mean, sure, Sean, sure. I feel it would be yeah. remiss of us as to, to not mention as Liberty Charge our uh, yeah, fully we're, funded solution. Yeah. I don't know if you'd like to say a bit. Yeah, no, so we we, we actually pay for everything. So we privately fully fund um, the, the, the rollout of the charge points. Yes, we are more than happy to support, uh, to, to help sort of local authorities get funding, but we don't we don't need that um so predominantly we can fully fund it uh as peter says yes the user gets charged and yes that we we would collect the money um rfid card or app um then obviously there is the with the rapid model there's contactless payment um i do know that there's obviously discussions around uh you know if you receive government funding i believe your sort of 7.1 kilowatts and above now needs to have some contactless payment i suppose the only downside with that is uh, you know the cost of installing that then gets put onto a user but yeah i mean as a, as a business we we have the ability to uh 
privately fully fund it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question we've had in is from Murray Cyril, um, who has asked, how often are you seeing public slash resident protest as a blocker to rolling out on street charge stations? Uh, Ian, I think you, you yeah. uh, wanted to come yeah. in on that. I'm, I'm happy to take that one. So, uh, yeah, what, we, what we've done is we have a kind of resident engagement process at the start. So anybody within 50 metres of present charging point is, is consulted and also on, on, that, on that street. Uh, through a kind of a questionnaire survey. So it's broader than just, do you like the location or not? Do you support it? It is about, well, what's your perceptions of it? Do you operate an electric vehicle? Are you looking to buy one? If so, when? Uh, what the kind of, what would help you make that kind of decision? So it's to kind of try and get a more kind of informed position. Uh, in terms of the sites that we've progressed, uh, some have fallen out because of opposition, but very few, to be honest. Uh, often it's kind of very small numbers and broadly 50-50. Uh, it does come down to, in terms of probably all kind of the politician, if it is 50-50, then you, there's, you know, there's a reason you could go both ways because you could say, well, it's not, it's not a majority of support, or you could say it's not. So, you know, that's, I think, part of it, why a kind of the politician has kind of a kind of a key role to play. Uh, and then obviously there is the kind of formal kind of TRO process around the kind of, the kind of parking bays. Uh, what, what we've done in, in uh, both North and West North Hampshire is, is uh, four bays to have parking controls to start with uh, in terms of restrictions. But the intention is, as demand increases, is, is to extend those kind of parking controls to the other two. So the answer is uh, relatively few have been blocked by residents because at the end of the day, we need the infrastructure. People are going to swap. I could perhaps also come in as a question there about uh, from somebody else about, about equity in terms of picking picking areas. It, it, that's something we've been very kind of conscious of in, 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 in North of Ants, that not to kind of focus on the kind of, you know, potentially kind of large, higher income, uh, kind of, kind of mm. Victorian, Edwardian kind of housing areas. Uh, and and the kind of, you know, we have a real kind of mix in terms of kind of income areas, uh, and uh, which is which is really, really important. Uh, yeah, we, I know Liberty kind of have information about kind of incomes and, and that kind of, uh, Kind of income, yeah, that kind of information you can actually kind of purchase, but it has no kind of influence whatsoever in terms of the kind of decisions we make. We're really keen to kind of get that kind of spread so everybody has a it is, you know, kind of, kind of level enough agenda so everybody has an opportunity to, to own and operate a, an electric vehicle. Brilliant, thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, uh, Dan or Peter, be interested in your your kind of uh, observations really on, on how many. Uh, what kind of blockers you typically encounter in terms of you know number of objections to, to particularly on street sites yeah um so in croydon to date we've only installed charging points where we're also doing a traffic management order and creating an ev only bay um and yeah there, there are objections in some places i was just having a quick look to see how many um, it's relatively small, um, sort of maybe 5% or something, uh, and occasionally we will decide not to install, that it's just not worth the grief. Um, what we have did with some of the, um, I think about two of our, or two or three of our 50 or so Liberty Charge locations, because we were putting four bays in, um, we agreed that we'd start with just two of them being EV only and the other two not. Um, and then we're going to monitor and see what happens. As Dan was saying, the experience can be that you don't get as much usage because there is parking. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to be ready for objections. Um, I, I've not had a large number. Yeah, I'd... brilliant. Okay, and Dan, what was your kind of experience by comparison? Yeah, I mean, sort of head headline is a, a lot less than we used to get, and I think that's because mm. there's a sort of a, a public acceptance that these are required and and they are coming. It could also help that our site selection has got better over the years. Um, so we're putting them in, in the places that are going to, you know, less likely to cause inconvenience. But I think uh, I think the key here is just you know going back to my initial point. If you've got your criteria where you, you're agreed that you've got the evidence base for selecting these sites and taking them forward, then I I wouldn't see um, public objection as the 
the scary beast in the room to put you off taking anything forward. Brilliant. Fighting talk. <laughs> um, I think that's yeah. sorry. I think that is the case because I mean we've had obviously being on the or not that I've ever dug a hole in my life, but you know being there with and, and sort of controlling the civils gangs and you know there has been objections, there has been sites where we've had to actually <laughs> get the guys to sort of actually pull away from site. Um, but as Dan says, it's knowing your strategy and sticking to that strategy. I mean, one of the things obviously when you're doing that consultation, if you've an engagement with residents, if they've got haven't got an EV then they're likely, you know, they've got no skin in the game, so they can be a little bit, you know, a bit off. But, I mean, one of the things I always use is, you know, having rolled out uh, super fast broadband back in 2010, we had a similar thing where people were uh, going to the extremes of chaining their self to the fence, et cetera. But, you know, once it's yeah. in and people have got over that initial sock, can you imagine now if you actually went round and said, right, we're going to take out that super fast broadband because... <laughs> You know, you you didn't like us putting the green cabinet out there. Um, so I think that's with EV as well, and that's one of the things that we've seen. If you stick to the strategy that the council has and then follow that through, people will benefit from the end of it, and it will give them the confidence to actually go and buy an EV as well, knowing that there's infrastructure there in place. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question we've had in, they're coming in thick and fast, which is always good, um, is from Keith Horgan who has asked, what plans are there for a universal charging card that means a user can charge at any charge point? Who wants to take that? So it's a, it's a kind of broader question around interoperability, yeah. or interoperability I suppose, and to what extent maybe yeah. that's something you've thought about as part of your deployments or, or, or will be thinking about? There was recent directives that, that, that were saying all, as, as, uh, as Sean mentioned, all charge points above seven kilowatts, 7.1 kilowatts need to have a, you know, contact access and, and pay as you go act access. So that sort of overcome some of the hurdles of, you know, the, the, this, this misnomer that you're going to need a, a million and one different apps and a, diff, a million and one different accounts. Um, I think it, that's something for the, the, the sort of commercial sector that is inevitable to, to, to pick up. It's, you know, I like an EV charging to, to mobile phones and how they've developed over the years and the different networks. And when it started off, it text messages to different networks with different prices and, and all sorts of differences. But but it sort of it standardizes itself sort of over the years. So I think it, eventually it, it, there will be sort of open access and, and ways of doing it. But it's, a, it's, it's for the, the private sector to, to manage that. Okay, and the next question is from Joe Pentecost, who has asked, are, are any of you providing dedicated EV charging bays for people with disabled badges? How much are they being used? What difficulties are you finding? So if the, if the answer to the first question isn't yes, then the second one. <laughs> but is it something you're thinking about longer term, I suppose, is, is a related question to that. Yeah, eighty-five percent of our residents don't have off-street parking, so that includes all, all our disabled residents as well. We've got two hundred dedicated, personalised disabled bays, and you know we're aware of that. You know those residents also need to transition, and you know schemes like motor motability, they're promoting switching to EV. So it is a user group that we do need to support. Um, it's, we're in the very early stages of working out the strategy for doing this. And the key consideration here is if you install a charge point on street, it will be through one of our commercial partners and that resident will be being charged, you know, commercial rates. So it's not going to be the rates that you could get if you had private off street parking. So that's the, that's the hurdle we're at at the moment. Uh, and is it something anyone else is? Is it uh, Ian Peter? Is it are you starting to think about how you kind of cater towards those particular types of provision as well? Yeah, it's certainly something that, that is on our mind. And, and what I want to do increasingly is to integrate the, the blue badge request process with um, EV charging. And interestingly, uh, we, we've had a, a slight increase now in people where they've applied for a dropped curb um, and been turned down. Uh, and they're now coming to me saying, can I have a charging point, please? It's a tricky one. It may be different in other councils, but an awful lot of our blue badge bays are only there for um, a relatively short period of time, maybe two or three years. 
Um, so you do also have to consider, is this the right place on the road um, for a charging point? Um, if you're doing lamp column bollards, then the lamp column may or may not be in the right place. Um, so I, I haven't got the perfect answer either. Um, I, I definitely try to favour having a charging point near the Blue Badge Bay, uh, if that is the solution. The other thing you have to be aware of is that if you put the charging point on the Blue Badge Bay, then it makes it difficult for other people to use that, particularly if it's a, a single head charging point. Um, so I'm sorry that's not as clear as it should be, but that probably is where the rest of you are at. I think it's a really good answer, and I think it, I think you're right. It does reflect kind of where the industry is at, although it is moving quickly, isn't it? Sean, sure, I don't know if you want to touch yeah. on the, the the kind of innovative, accessible bay designs that that Liberty Charge are working on. Yeah, there. so we're, I mean, yeah, the BSI are about to obviously. I mean, when it's coming out, it's supposed to be late summer. I'm not quite sure how long summer goes on for in this country, but. Uh, <laughs> They're supposed to be rolling out the new sort of accessible charging for electric vehicles. Um, I think they started the consultation, public consultation back in March and ended in May. Uh, as a business, we've actually started to look at that already. Um, and we've actually come up with a number of designs uh, that we're sort of trying to sort of share with sort of local authorities that we're working with. And, and that's both on the potentially on the rapid and on the fast as well. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're sort of on it at the moment. We're waiting to see actually what the... Uh, the BSI actually issue um, at the end of summer. Um, and then obviously we'll sort of define our designs and redesign uh, accordingly. So yeah, no, we are, we're actually in that space already and we've done a number of designs that uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've sort of shared with a number of LAs. Yeah, and as mentioned, your mobility users are gonna be early adopters. Yeah. Uh, they get grants towards their car. They're, they're very often doing low mileage. So they're, they're a fairly perfect EV customer. 100 percent brilliant okay thank you all um next question is from chris jackson hi chris i'm assuming it's chris jackson wsp um uh do you plan on sharing utilization of charge points with the public uh this would be helpful to highlight trends what are people's views on that I would need to yeah I mean at the moment that at the moment that is commercial sensitivity that obviously helps us base our business plan and business model etc so I would say in the short term most probably no uh, uh, how, how about as local authorities and, uh, and offices what kind of information would you be kind of keen to put out to, to the public obviously kind of beyond denouncing how many charges are available and what your plans are is there is there anything beyond that that you would want to kind of make available yeah we look at so we, we we don't necessarily share utilize data data um sort of per se but what, what we do try to do is estimate sort of the, the number of green miles sort of um that delivered through the charging network you know um, calculations to estimate the amount of co2 saved by sort of taking sort of um Ice, ice vehicles off the road and f facilitating that and that's part of um you know building that narrative around ev and sort of developing support for it so so, so yeah that's what we might look at and, and in terms of looking at that over time as well yeah so their positive contribution towards kind of wider objectives yeah exactly yeah brilliant okay um and probably, next... uh, uh, Matt, probably yeah, similar from us as, as well in, and also probably in terms of accessibility question, question answered earlier about accessibility to a charging point inevitably uh you know take up is going to be slower than something like for example super fast as, as sean mentioned because you, know, you can't just switch over your package like you can to an isp very kind of quickly you know people take you know keep a car for you know years so you know you're not going to get it's unlikely you're going to get that really quick switch over I think it's a really good point. Yeah. Um, the, the next question we've had in is from Michelle Armstrong, who has asked, how can local authorities ensure equity across the more viable, less, the more viable slash less viable areas within their council? So it's something 
uh, I think that uh, each of you have touched on to a degree, but maybe if you could just expand on on how you you make sure that it's not only the the areas uh, of more obvious immediate demand or the better off areas that get all of the charge points that you do have that equitable provision across the area. I think the okay, first I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, okay. yeah what, what we did just building on my answer earlier was around kind of looking at our kind of left behind communities. You know, we've, got, we've got three in, in Kettering, uh, Orby. Uh, so look, look at look at those uh, look at those kind of indices that we use for communities in terms of kind of uh, uh, yeah, how prosperous they are and make sure that they, they are they are you know, we, we look to identify sites in, in those locations and, that, and that's that's what we've done even with the, you know, the 19 sites that have been installed so there's a benefit in those communities which is which is great news uh, and Dan sorry did you want to build on on, on yours as well yeah, I was just going to sort of point, you, you know, we, we've all got a, a net zero sort of ambition, you know, in terms of viability, everybody drives in, in all areas, you know, servicing is required in all areas. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's important to, to get the mix across any area that you're looking at delivering EV charge points. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and, and Sean, sure, I don't know if you yeah. want to kind of comment from, from the Liberty Charles perspective, but yeah, I know the from, portfolio approach is something exactly. we always advocate. Absolutely. I mean, for us, it's the portfolio approach. I mean, we are happy to uh, sort of invest and roll out a, a, a network with, with, with the coverage within that uh, local authority. Um, yes, there are ones that potentially will be sort of not have the high utilisation, and actually there'll be some that, you know, actually would... Uh, require sort of quite high DNO costs. I mean, and I think obviously we've, you know, maybe not getting into too much detail, but if you look at maybe some of the funding, the Levi funding, rather than the Levi funding being used for those sort of nice locations, you know, potentially could that be used more for the locations that are, you know, high DNO costs, um, or actually, do you know what, the utilization isn't going to be great, but it allows everyone to have access to charging points. And especially where you get people that don't have the uh, the ability to sort of park off street as well, which is, yeah, is obviously I think it's something like, is it a 40 million households or whatever can't have that. So, yeah, again, I think that's uh, quite key from, from our side of it anyway. Uh, next question we've had in is from uh, Stephen Judge, who said, uh, may I ask what your advice would be for a strategy for installing EV charging points in small to medium sized villages, brackets a few hundred residents? So again, this kind of relates quite nicely to what we've just been talking about, really, and potentially some of the more challenging use cases. Um, obviously, kind of a, a bit different to the inner and outer London borough context. But um, uh, Ian, I'm not sure if you want to kind of take that one as to what your advice yeah. would be when it comes to the smaller scale villages. It's definitely something we're we're, we're looking at. Uh, you know, there there are kind of as you as the audience will know, kind of restrictions in terms of pavement widths, which probably tend to be slightly kind of narrower in villages, which can make it kind of problematic. But we we're definitely in terms of the the next sites that are coming forward in North of Ants, it's already in seven towns. Uh, could be some villages involved in that. Part of it as well is that what I said to you before about kind of in engagement with parish councils, you know, and them to suggest sites, uh, you know, locally, is, because it is quite difficult to find them in villages. Uh, the other, well, then you'll have kind of power considerations, specials, but in terms of it's really helpful kind of contacting the kind of parish councils and residents through the survey I mentioned to try and you know, see, see if they can suggest any any sites, because quite often are they, you, are they, you just have to kind of look for quite hard. And it might be you can't have kind of four parking bays. You may need there might might be less than that. It's about being flexible. I think from yeah. a, a liberty, sorry, Matt, I was going to say from a liberty charge uh, perspective as well. I mean, we are we are actually speaking to sort of smaller parish councils, etc., and, and and actually looking to deploy in some of them as well. So, from our side of it, you know, we're more than happy to have uh, th those discussions to sort of again, we, you know, our ambition is to roll out a national network. So. You know that includes everyone from sort of large towns to the smaller smaller villages as well. It also it also includes uh, sorry jump in again. Yeah. Uh, speaking to the kind of uh, the parish council because they may well have a community hall with some with, with parking. It may be just locating a convenient location. So that's something we're all you know, we're investigating. You know if, if on streets challenging, 
you know, it's, it's, it's just some kind of com local community space parking that can be used. Yeah, particularly where it could double up as an overnight resident charging hub yep. or, or a kind yep. of uh, en route charging hub or destination hub, yeah. Um, uh, conscious of time, I know we've got still plenty of questions flooding in. I'll do my best to get through all of these. It's really good how many we're getting coming through. Um, so uh, Rosemary Aitchison um, has asked, what sorts of things can be put in place if there is no on-street EV points and a householder installs their own point? What are the safety implications of them plugging in with the cable across the pavement? Oh, okay, other than yeah. the obvious trip hazard. This is one of your favourites, Sean. I know, and I think well, everyone's probably got experience and a view on this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, if the infrastructure is there, I mean, people have got an EV, they're going to go to all extremes to sort of do it. I mean, I've been. I mean, I might be corrected, but I believe under the Highways Act 1980, I believe it is the person that actually uh, rolls out the lead, etc. Then is, is takes responsibility. So the chances are they're going to need to have public liability insurance. Mm. But there's also the bit around the safety aspect as well. You know, you know, part of the IET code of practice is to ensure that you know people are two and a half meters away from other electrical infrastructure, etc., to avoid sort of shock. Um, so yeah, people are going to do it. Um, it's, it's not something I actually agree with. I also think as well, potentially there's that unfair, if someone can't do that, they're actually having to pay 20% VAT rather than that person only paying 5% VAT because they're taking it off their house supply. But, you know, apart from that, yeah, I, I'm i not a great, I, I don't believe that's a, a solution or should be done as a, an answer to the, the problem. Uh, Peter, you look like you had a comment to make on that. I'm not sure if others do as well. Yeah, I know in, in Croydon we've, we don't allow the, the cables across the pavement even with a cover because of that public liability issue. Which household is actually going to be taking out that insurance? Um, I mean, it, th th the issue does show just how creative humans are. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought the 30 meter cable was a nice example of that yeah. as well. Absolutely terrifying what you could it, see be done with that. It, yeah. it, it will cost you £700 to buy, but uh, obviously you'll most probably be guaranteed to be able to charge anywhere in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I mean, what, one thing is that people imagine they're going to have to charge every night. Well, it, it isn't the case, you know. Um, and also going back slightly um, to the question around the village. You only need a hand, you know, two or three people using a charging point regularly for it to be commercially viable. Um, and once that is there, it will grow. Um, you, you'll actually be needing more. So the, the industry is still in a very early phase. You know, some of our locations aren't doing that well, but they're still the right thing in the right place at the right time. Uh, because if we don't put them in now, um, the, the change in car ownership won't happen. Right, we've got one more question at the moment, which I'm going to try and see if we can answer in the seven odd minutes we've got left. So uh, from Keith Horgan, are charging costs per kilowatt hour displayed on the charging points you install, e.g. on an LED display, and are the costs updated regularly, brackets, prices are going up quarterly at least? I think with the with the that. pricing, well, I think with the pricing thing, there's a number of obviously, you know, obviously we're all on sort of social media and different sort of uh, platforms that allows. I mean, yeah, there's a a lot of CPOs that are having to put their price up, um, and it is being driven by, you know, the, the, what everyone else is uh, suffering from. So yeah, I mean, obviously at Liberty Charge, we try not to do it on a on a regular basis. Um, you know, we increased, uh, I'm going to say, sort of six months back, I think, when it was. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, you know, wholesale energy prices are forcing everyone into that position. Um, with regards to displaying, yes, I mean, it's on the app. Uh, the, the, you know, if you go on the app, it's on the screen. And I think especially with Rapids as well, it's on there as well. So, yeah, would be my answers. Uh, did anyone else want to come in on that? Your your views generally on on uh, how tariffs are displayed across your the networks in your in your uh, areas? I think it's you know it's it, as Sean says it's you know everyone's on sort of social media and and on the apps and to get get the information that way it's it's like uh, like petrol pump prices 
people know when they're going to go up and when they're going to go down and, and where the where the cheapest ones in their area are. Yeah, and then, then market market forces drive yeah drive performance and 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 which ones prove most popular and best to use yeah uh, and i suppose um, that's one one of the sort of one of the things that I'd, i would encourage other officers to sort of bear in mind you know ev charging i think personally should be looked at sort of the utility provision and there is a lot of it you know it is is it in its infancy in and you know market forces will dictate how things um you know, as I alluded to earlier, standardise themselves and, and level off in the long run. So I think, you know, if we get too bogged down in trying to sort of prescribe how how that market is going to operate in certain areas, then it could become a hindrance to to being able to sort of ignite that sort of um, that, that transition. Brilliant. Okay. Well, uh, we've had a couple more questions in, but I'm afraid we are kind of out of time now. So I just need to wrap up. And, and, and thank our speaker. So just to kind of recap on some of the points we've covered today. And f firstly, thank you to our panelists for a really good discussion. I feel like we covered a lot of ground there, managed to answer a lot of questions, not quite all of them, but, but a, a good number. Um, and I think we, we you know, from, from what, what was covered, we, we've, we've had a good amount of discussion around the importance of getting uh, support, both from um, senior kind of uh, uh, senior officials who who, who may uh, be concerned from pushback on particular sites and getting buy into the strategy and the plan, and then the the the, the kind of internal uh, support and coordination as well across departments. We've talked around around the different deployment types in terms of charging solution and different types of location and the role they have to play. And I think there's a, a consensus really that it's very much a case of needing a, a mix of charging solutions, the right charging solution for the right location. Um, and then we, we started to talk around some of the, the, the specifics that came up through the questions around uh, how you might cater for uh, ensuring there's equity in charging provision. Um, and things like uh, safety around the different deployment models and so on. So um, I'll just run our last live poll of the day, uh, which is just to ask uh, whether people would uh, benefit from, from any further discussions uh, on, on this. So I'll just run that now. And, and if you can respond to that, that's great. We'll have to follow up on that. Um, and I'd just like to, to kind of let everyone know that the next session we've got coming up in this webinar series is on the 18th, uh, Tuesday, the 18th of October, and that is around funding and procurement. So it's something that we've touched on today. Um, and we, It's a big topic in its own right. Um, so it, it's something we're, we're, we'll cover in that in that that later session. So. Um, yeah, I just remains to say thank, thank you again to all our panelists today. I hope you've all found that an interesting discussion to our audience. And um, yeah, this this recording will be available on our on our website shortly. Uh, should anyone want to revisit anything or share with share with colleagues? Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Lovely. Thank you very thank much, you everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.